Welcome back. This is Danielle from Spore Self Natural. And today I'm just doing a little bit of labeling. Um, we do have a handful of videos that I am getting ready to edit. It just takes so much time. And when you have chatty videos like this, I can kind of just put them up a lot quicker. So with that being said, I figured I would just record myself um, going through and labeling a handful of product that I'm just trying to refill. And I wanted to talk about being a new small business and really not so much like how to get started, like, you know, the back end details, but more or less my recommendations or what I did and I felt like helped me grow the appropriate way. Like I am a slow and steady type of girl. If that is not for you, I'm probably not the one to take advice from. I like slow and steady. I like to start with one thing and like, you know, gradually move it forward. I like to plan a lot, that type of thing. So if you're looking to just like be thrown into this and have full collections ready to go, might not be the best advice for you. So really what I wanted to chat about was things that I did or wish that I did um when I first started in 2015 where I was selling to friends and family and then in 2016 I officially got my um business license started selling on Etsy and in person okay I didn't have a website um for years I just sold on Etsy or in person that type of thing or like over Facebook or Instagram something like that so <clears throat> In that time, you find a lot of inspiration, right? Like you find these people on social media, on YouTube, locally, wherever you're going to find them. And you, I'm not going to say that you want to mimic them, but you find that inspiration and you see what they're doing, maybe how good they're doing with a particular thing. And it brings some um excitement to you and you're like well if they're selling x y and z maybe i should be selling it this is a trap don't do it okay when you first start out i highly highly recommend that you do one type of thing at a time and you go slow i mean there's nothing better than knowing your product inside and out um and really understand each ingredient that you're using okay this is like the most important thing i think i could probably tell you don't rush it everybody wants to rush it i want to rush it you want to rush it like i get it i totally understand don't do it though um and i say that because that's how so many accidents happen right mm -hmm. we get excited you see this new product come out we're like we need to add this to our line we're going to make so much money so and so is doing it. It's going to be great. Don't do it. Okay. When I first started on Etsy, I had four different scents of soap. Four. I had three, three or four different scents of lip balm and an herbal salve. And that's it. Those were the things that I was making daily or weekly. I knew each of those products so well. I knew how they did in different weather, how they shipped each ingredient, where they came from, how they performed, how long it took to go through a tin of salve or a, a bar soap. I knew uh, if it was left on a shelf for the soap, how long it would last. If it was in a sleeve, how long it would last. If a man used it versus a woman used it. I knew everything. That's what you need. That is the most important part of this business is knowing your product inside and out. And when you come out with a line, and there's no shade this way, I don't mean it like this, but when you come out with such an extensive line that maybe hasn't been tested as lengthy um, and you haven't gone through as much because there's so many products to go through, right? Like I'm sure you're testing them, but are you testing them at the length you would if you only came out with a smaller core line is really what I'm trying to say. And I learned a lot from that. Certain things I was starting to test. I was like, oh, this soap is great. I love it. It lasts me four weeks in a shower. 
in a soap bag, it lasts me five. When my husband uses it, 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 you know, it's three. Great. I knew everything, but I didn't because I didn't have that soap for three months. Well, I did have it for three months, but you know what I mean? Like three months, six months, nine months, 12 months testing in different types of weather, in different spaces in your bathroom, different environments. Did I have my friends and family try it? And in their environment, how well did it perform? Those are things that I think a lot of people, they test it for themselves, they think it's good, and then they move forward. And I think you really need to test, 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 and go slow. Only do a couple. There's nothing wrong with coming out with a line or thinking to yourself like, oh, so-and-so has more. I need more to add to my collection or my core line before I can release it. If you want to release your business and your product with three things, go for it. I think that's amazing. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And I think people are going to get more excited about it, to be completely honest, because when you have this big, huge line, it can be overwhelming to people. So if you're starting off with uh, two soaps and two lip balms and a solve, you're golden. There's no reason you can't start your business now. Um, and I think it's good that you can become more familiar with the products and the raw materials doing it that way. I'm not saying it's the right way and the only way, but for my personal experience, low and slow is the way to go when it comes to this type of business. Um, I know there are people that like want to be big and make like crazy money and blow up on like TikTok and stuff like that. That's not for me. And I wish them well. And I think that's amazing. I can't handle that type of responsibility and pressure. <laughs> like it's just not for me. Would I like for a video to be or um, a social media post to be well received and get a couple orders out of it or sell out of something that I'll have the appropriate amount of time to restock? Sure. Like that's totally for me. But for hundreds of thousands or millions of people to see something and then it be out of stock and I'm making the product not at my current quality level is not cool with me. We don't like that. So that's like the hard part about social media is you're supposed to post and do all these things <laughs> but like what happens if you i mean I, I know the off chance of going like virals like slim to none but like what happens if you do <laughs> what happened i made a couple gift boxes um just to have on hand i have a market this coming sunday it's an outdoor market it's going to be like 60 degrees out so it should be nice should be a good turnout it's the first for that um the first market of the season for this particular artist market. So I think we'll do pretty well. I'm just going to label these up real quick. And in the meantime, what else did I want to talk about? We want to talk about, oh, a core line. Like what's the ideal number of pieces in a core line? I think that is for you to decide. But for me, between four and six, I think four and six is a great number. And I say that based off scent profiles and what people tend to come back with when they give you their unsolicited advice <laughs> or advice that maybe you ask for. We do send out questionnaires uh, probably like once a year to really good customers. So I have probably like 60 or 70 really good close customers that I work with um, quite often. And I feel like I can ask them that type of question and know I'm going to get a real answer back. I do make it anonymous, but I'll send it out and it'll have like 10 or 15 questions. And if they answer the full thing, I'll give them a coupon for their next purchase. So when I got my number for core lines, how I figured it out, I used to do five. Um, I've since gone to six. But how I figured it out is bestsellers and then cents. So I made originally my original core line. You want to always make sure that you have something floral, citrus, earthy, or herbaceous, however you'd like to, to call that. Um, so like the first one, I would do like a lavender, right? Most people like lavender. 
The second one would probably be like a fruitier blend. So you're going to put like lemon, lime, grapefruit, bergamot, those type of things in there. The third would be more like herbaceous. So what I mean by that would be like eucalyptus, um, fir needle, um, cypress, like piney, those type of things. That would probably be my third one. Fourth one would be like patchouli, frankincense, um, elemi. That would be probably my fourth one. Fifth one, I would do like a, unix, a unisex scent, however you feel is necessary. And then the sixth one, I would probably do minty, peppermint, spearmint, wintergreen, um, that type of thing. So that's where I originally started. And then I started selling those four to six scents. You know, you recreate them, you figure out what does and doesn't work with your customer base. And then that's where I got my core line. It took me years to kind of figure that out. I think that I always said that I had a core line, but the core line changed all the time. Like the same sense would change. I would just sell something. If it sold really well, I'd keep it. If it didn't, it would disappear. So that's really how I developed my um, essential core line. And I know that sounds silly, but it works for me. And what I would recommend that you do after you start selling your line um, on your either your website or Etsy or whatever um, avenue you're going is to go sell in person. Before you start adding more stuff to your line, go sell your products in person. You're going to be able to get that feedback even at your first market on how people are perceiving your product. Do, do they think it's too expensive? Do they think um, your scents are too light, are too strong, are too colorful, um, would do better in a certain area? Like you want to try to figure that stuff out. And it, it takes time. It takes years, to be completely honest, to figure all of that out. But it is nice to um okay, just put this down here just in case to get that feedback I, I wish that i did that sooner i think that i was on etsy for so long kind of banging my head against the wall trying to figure out what my ideal customer wanted and you always want to know who your ideal customer is right like you want to know that right off the bat but it's still a learning curve like you might think you know who your customer is and who you're selling to and you're not, you're selling to somebody who's completely different than that. Like it's hard when you find that out and you're like, I'm selling to this type of person. And then it starts selling a lot. And the person that's actually buying your product and enjoying it isn't your original ideal customer. And so do you pivot and you just say, okay, this is my new customer. This is what I'm going to, this is who I'm going to sell my products to, or do you go in a different direction and say, okay, back to the drawing board. I'm not hitting my ideal customer. This is who I absolutely have to want to sell to and come up with a different plan of action on how to find that ideal customer. Um, I, th I think that's one of the hardest things is trying to like find your target audience. Essentially, you know what I mean? At least it was for me. Like I was convinced at one point that I was selling to like a young mom earthy crunchy in her early 20s to late 30s like you know starbucks mom who drives the white suv like that's who i thought that i was selling to for like a year or two into business like had everything and then i realized after doing some questionnaires and really talking to my customers in person because when you have somebody buy from you online like i don't know who they are I don't know who Jane is. Does is Jane a 50-year-old woman with no kids or is she a 30-year-old woman with a 2-year-old? Like I don't know who Jane is. And when you're going to markets and you're chatting with these people, you figure out who Jane is, right? So I went longer than I probably should have, but that's totally like a learning curve part of owning your own business, thinking who I'm selling to and then 
realizing who my ideal customer was. And my ideal customer is probably from, I'd say like 35 to 60. Um, they're definitely on the older side. Some have kids, some don't. They want more natural stuff. But most of my like hardcore um, regular customers who order from me every month without a doubt are probably in their 40s to 50s. And I didn't realize that for quite some time. So when I was trying to design my labels and my listings, I was putting things in there for my younger audience when in fact my audience was older and they didn't care about those things. They cared about these things. So I only say that as like feedback for you. Hopefully it's something that you can resonate with and understand. You always think you're going to know who your ideal customer is. And you have all this information and all this research you've done. And it doesn't always work out that way. Your product was made for a reason. But your customer can and will change. I promise you that. Unless you decide to go a whole different route and say, I need to have this customer. So you're going to change your whole business plan due to that. That's probably the longer way to do it. But each his own everyone's different but i thought i was selling to somebody completely different than who i was so just thought you might enjoy that tidbit all right so gift boxes we are done i will show you do you want to let's open a gift box so you can see what they sell them like. in person we're going to figure out what our customer wants after that once you and i'm not saying go to like one market i'm saying like go to multiple markets you want to get a lot of feedback um Maybe try to collect their email addresses. So if something new comes out or you have a coupon, um, you know, you can get that repeat customer. And then I would work on your website. Maybe that's wrong for some people and they want a website first, but it it's very overwhelming. Like just running a business just like this part of like making product labeling inventory um learning rules and regulations which you can and can't do like there's just so much that people don't tell you that goes into a business and people are like oh yeah you run a business like 24 7 like you never stop and i'm like uh-huh yeah sure like you literally never stop and there's just so many behind the scenes things that you don't think about or didn't think about until you needed to think about and and i don't say this to um to steer you clear of it i just say this so that you're informed i feel like on line or on youtube everybody just shows you like the great things about it like look at how much money i'm making or these new products that i'm coming up with or this great feedback i'm getting and they're not giving you like, oh, but it took me four hours to make this label. And the feedback I'm getting is because I'm offering them this, that, and the other thing. And I'm not saying all people. I don't mean it like that. But sometimes when I sit down after a long day and I want to relax or learn a little bit more about my craft, like it's nice to be able to relate with someone and then be like, oh, I totally messed up on this thing and I just had to make like 60 of something it's not all that it's cracked up to be or you know I spent all this time making a label and it turns out it's the wrong way to label it or something like that like I'm not looking for failures by any means I don't mean it that way but it's just nice to find like the human part of people and like the flaws as well within a business, not just how great someone's doing, but like knowing that they could be struggling or having the same type of feelings as me. You know? That's why I say that. So. Online mark or online, like Etsy, in person market, then build your website. That's how I would, that's how I did it and how I would do it again. I think that if I was trying to do all of that at once, I wouldn't have stuck with it. 
I wouldn't have stuck with it. I know I wouldn't. I would have, after so many years, just said, like, this isn't for me. That's because I'm a low and slow type of person. Like, I like to take my time. I'm the little turtle. I'll still get to the end, but I need to take my time. Like, I can't be rushed with certain things. So, let's label all of these. Look at how many... I had to make 30 of these solves because I made a mistake. I was rushing. I have to pick my daughter up from the bus stop by a certain time. Um, we live on a dead end, but we live off a of busy street. And so she gets dropped off at the busy street. She's 10 years old, but it's busy enough that I would prefer her not to be dropped off on a main road. So I'm rushing. I want to make this solve. Uh, it's not something I had to make. I had like four or five left, but I wanted to have my stock. So I wasn't like behind in something. I don't like when stuff goes out of stock if it doesn't need to. Beside the point, I need to make these. They usually come in like, I think I do like 15 at a time. And I wasn't paying attention. And so all of my oils and butters and all that stuff's together. And I go to measure my essential oils out. And I didn't tear it out to grams and I don't measure my products in ounces. I don't think it's as accurate as it should be. It's just me. It's how I do my formulas. Um, and I measure the first one out in ounces. So I realized it halfway pouring, but instead of getting rid of all the oils and butters and wasting that essential oil, um, I just decided to double my batch. So I now have 30 of one type of solve. So with that being said, see, everybody makes mistakes. <laughs> but instead of throwing my mistake away, I just made more of it. Try to make the best of the situation. So we're going to label these up real quick. And then what else would I highly recommend? Oh, you know what I didn't do as soon as I should have? This is something I definitely should have done sooner and invested more money in originally, I think it's totally worth it, is um, your inventory. I think inventory is super, super expensive. I have done so many different types of inventory tracking and it's more important than you think it is. It's super important <clears throat> come tax time, super, super, super important for like write-off purposes. and. If you're doing like multiple markets, you know, or in-person events, or you're selling from two different platforms, say like Shopify or Etsy, like it's super important. Um, that's something that I would certainly invest in. Um, at one point I was selling through Shopify and through Etsy. And the only um, platform that I could keep track of inventory without having to inventory my product um, or go into like my Shopify. So say if something sold on Etsy um, and I had to go into Shopify and adjust it manually, the only program that I know that does that um, on Mac, that's the thing. Like a lot of the, th the lot of these um, things are good for like Windows and I don't have Windows. I have a Mac. Um, I'm actually not an Apple girl. <laughs> don't have like an Apple phone or any of that, but I do like their computers. I think that they're super reliable. You can keep them for a couple years more than if you had like a Windows or something um, in regards to like virus. And then you can um, like share from one computer to the other. So that's something that I really liked about Mac. Um, hence the reason that I have it. So the only program that I have found that is Mac compliant um, is Inventora. I did really, and I, stu I still do like them. I don't mean it that way. I think it's a good program, but um, I ended up hopping on that bandwagon when they first launched or the year after they launched. This was at least five years ago now, right? Um, and they were doing like their first year. I don't even think that there was a price or there was a really low price. And then if you bought the yearly membership, it was like $100 a year, which still isn't hateful. Now it's up to like I think it's 180 and I've been with them for years and it doesn't change the price point. It's a tax write-off, but it does get a little bit pricey. So I wanted to, because I'm only utilizing Shopify now and I'm not using Etsy or 
any other um, platform, I decided to change it up. Um, and I'm actually going to go, I'm still in the process, but I have to buy a Windows computer, like a cheaper one, and I'm just going to use it for SoapMaker 3 and use SoapMaker 3. If you have SoapMaker 3, do you like it? Do you not? Like, I've heard great things about it. I like how um, streamlined it is in the process of inventory. I don't know if you can do like at the end another platform if it merges. Um, but I do like that you can actually keep all of your raw material inventory in there as well. And your recipes. Like that was huge for me. Once I realized that you could also house like your... Um, your formulations in there i was like this is amazing because a lot of formulations you have to use different websites so like depending on what you're making sometimes like you have to go for soap you have to go to a soap making one if you're doing a lotion a lip balm something like that you have to go to a different one so you're going to different places and granted i'm printing them out and putting them in like a recipe book or a formulation book it would be really nice to have everything in one and have it broken down for me without me manually making my formulation, putting it in, making a recipe, printing it out, breaking it down. It's done for you. And I think that the, um, the cost is $80 and you have it like forever. Like just buying a computer in and of itself is a write off, A, and it'll pay for itself within like two to three years. So I'm in the process of that. Um, I'd like to do that in the next couple months, but I would like to start my markets up so that I can get a good chunk of it so I can just pay it all off together, the computer and the um, soap maker three. I heard it's a huge learning curve that it takes a lot of time and effort to set it up, but I think it's going to be really good. So that might even be something that I'll wait until next year to do like january february march i'm not sure i don't know how much time i'm really supposed to dedicate to this if it's like inventora it took me like a week to set it all up but if this is more because you're setting more up i might have to wait so tell me if you have soap maker three how much time do you need to dedicate to setting it up i would be very grateful if you could Tell me that. Okay, so I think we have, oh no, we still need to do shampoo bars. Okay, so we talked about inventory. What else um, is huge that I think that I overlooked? Probably social media, but I cannot talk about social media. I am absolutely terrible at it. It is my biggest downfall. It always will be. I absolutely loathe it. I don't understand it. Like I'll be on like a good rhythm for a little while and then I'll miss like one post and then everything goes to shit and I can't be seen again. So <laughs> I feel like I can never win. I can never um, be like my authentic self. It's so hard. Like doing this is easy because I'm just like talking to like you, but trying to like write it down and know what comes out of my mouth before it does is way harder to do. Um, and people are just real mean. Like if you don't like my video, you just scroll on by. And for whatever reason, when people see like um like a social media post, I feel like they're there's more opportunity for someone to be mean or nasty. I don't know, that's just my take on it. So, social media would probably be huge, but I cannot talk about that because um, I'm just not good at it. I'm sure there's other people on here that could give you tons of good advice when it came to social media, but that was not going to be me ever. Okay. And for my shampoo bars, um, I've been making shampoo bars for a couple years now, but I don't, I, I haven't sold them. Um, or if I do, it's just at in-person markets to like my regular customers. So I keep them to the side because they're, 
are so many different types of hair, so many different types of people, what they do and don't like. But my shampoo bar has gone through, God, I can't tell you how many changes, 15, 20 changes. And I make a really good shampoo bar. Um, I use SCI as my main ingredient and foaming apple. So those are my two main ingredients in here. And I absolutely love it. Um, I have a super, super sensitive scalp. I was a hairstylist for years um, in, my, in my previous life. <laughs> and so I know a lot about hair. And I think that's why I was so picky about it. Um, but I will be launching the shampoo for the summer release. But I sell them in person. Um, so if I have a customer, they just ask me and I will give it to them. But in regards to conditioner, I have tried all the different conditioners. Um, I actually want a liquid conditioner. I'm not a big, it took me a long time just to get on the shampoo bar train because it's like not a liquid conditioner. I can't, I can't do it. I've made a couple and they're all right, but they're just not perfect. And I want perfect, which I think is definitely a downfall for me. I have four different conditioner recipes that I like, but I don't love. So I'm still going to be testing probably for a couple more months. I've had dozens of people try them. Everyone tells me they like them, but I'm just, I think I'm just expecting it to be salon quality. So that's why I haven't released it yet. Um, but like, like that being said, like, I think it's a good, it's a good quality to have and a bad quality to have when you're so precise on what you want for your customer, for your product itself. Like I could have released these two years ago, three years ago, but I chose not to because it wasn't to my specification. Did I lose money doing that? Probably, but like there's a certain quality of product that I like to put out. Um, and that's why I say slow and steady all the time. Cause a lot of my products take a lot of, um, research and time and energy and testing. And when I test, I don't just test on myself. Um, I test on family and friends, uh, regular customers. You know, if somebody asks for something and I'm ready to make that product, that person that asks me if they're a regular customer of mine, they will get that first one once I've, you know, I'm happy with it um, to test out. And that I think goes a long way with your customers as well. And don't like bombard them and be like, oh, you asked for this. You've ordered for me one time. Try this. I'm talking about people that have been with me for, for years and then have ordered dozens upon dozens of times. Um, not just like a random person that asked you to make something that they wanted. But I think it, it definitely builds that relationship with your customer for them to feel um, a part of it included in some way. So that is my two cents on little tips or tricks to start a soap making business. I'm sure I missed a ton of stuff, but I don't want this video to be super long. And I'm not looking to tell you how to start your business, just more or less things that I have learned along the way and things that did or didn't work for me. So I hope this video has been somewhat helpful and I will see you in the next one. Have a great day. Bye.